located just 15 miles from downtown Houston, in the San Jacinto River, is one of the most toxic waste dumps in the world. According to the EPA, the San Jacinto River Waste Pit Superfund site is an old dump site for paper mill waste that was created in the 1960s. The site subsided and now most of it is underwater and subject to the flow of the San Jacinto River. The site has released dioxin and other toxic pollutants into the San Jacinto River in Galveston Bay for the past 50 years. Because of the dioxins that have already been the Houston area. The site is clearly visible from Interstate 10 crossing the San Jacinto River if you were to look at it. Since its inception in 
inception, um, working to try to hold the companies accountable and ensure that they move at the speed at which the EPA expects of them. Um, Annie from office is here. Can you wave at everybody? Uh, so if you need anything at all from our office, feel free to reach out to her. She's going to be here for the duration of the event tonight. We look forward to keeping, uh, to continue to working alongside you all so that we can make it safe out here. Thank you. Thank you. It's my Well, my apology, apology to the attorney, uh, she did tell me that, and I just, I don't know, I think it was the gas that got to me. I couldn't remember. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Okay, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ashley and Lauren and other EPA representatives that's going to go through a brief presentation. And since we've got to be out so early tonight, we want to make sure that we allow enough time for you guys to ask your questions and get those questions answered. So, yes, ma'am. So, they're um, when, when we leave, or when the meeting is over, we need some of you guys to maybe help take care of you guys because there's only one man to put all this stuff away and ask me to put away. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, the comment was, before we leave, we have to take the chairs back inside. We don't have to put them in any type of order, just stack them like back and forth. But we, EPA and the state, uh, I think we should be able to take care of that. And then uh, the RPMs can remain outside to answer any questions that is being raised from the community just to make sure that our time is spent wisely in meeting the needs of the community. So we'll take care of getting the chairs back in. As far as the facilities, for um, ladies and men's bathroom, if you want to go back inside, uh, I don't think there's any problems with going back in because I think that gas has been cut off. So it will be safe to go back into the facilities to use the uh, men's and ladies room if you desire to do so. We're not telling that you have to, but if you like, we're re relieving EPA of that responsibility. Is that your option to go back inside? Okay, so with that, uh, we'll turn it over uh, to Ashley. Thanks, Janetta. Okay, I'm gonna sit right here because we actually also have a, an, um, a presence that's listening in right now through the computer, so this lets them hear a little bit more too, if that's okay. Um, we're gonna be really quick because we know the questions are just coming in. We wanna make sure we leave time for that and we, do have, to, we have this hard stop, so I'm gonna run through this really quick. Discussion topics for tonight. First, I'm going to do just a very brief site overview in case um, this is your first meeting. And then we will give a Southern Empowerment Remedial Action Update first. Then we'll go over the Northern Empowerment Remedial Design Update. And then um, a community update will kind of be given throughout it as well. So, just a quick site overview. This map shows the location of the San Jacinto site. Um, it's in Harris County. It's right at the I-10 bridge where it crosses the San Jacinto River. Um, it's about 10 miles north of Morgan's Point and 45, 40 miles north of Galveston. And just kind of zooming in closer at the site, um, we kind of divided our site into three areas. The northern base pit serves the green area that's right above I-10. The southern impoundments are the yellow out area just below I-10. And then the pink area is an area we call the sand separation area that's up over by that peninsula. Just a little bit of background. Um, the pits were built and used in the 1960s for paper mill waste that contained dioxin. And so um, the northern and southern pits cover about 15 acres each. And um, this site was added to Superfund, the Superfund priority list in 2008. And these are some aerial pictures of the site from 1966, 1997, and 2006. And you can see um, in the 1966 picture, both the north and the south southern pits are there, but the river isn't washing over them. And then over time, the land sank about 10 feet due to groundwater pumping, and there was some sand mining done in the area, and so it subsided. And so moving forward a few years, you can see in this last aerial picture, um, about half the pits were underwater. And so when the site was added to the Superfund list, that dioxin waste was actually exposed to the river. And so there were people who were wading and fishing at the site in this waste, and there was just uncontrolled releases to the river. And so, um, uh, therefore, we needed to put a temporary cap in place to prevent these exposures and releases to the waste while we investigated um, the site and um, we could find a permanent remedy for the site. So this cap is still in place today, and it's inspected 
expected quarterly. Um, it's also inspected after big storms and such to just make sure that it's still intact and protected. So this brings us to the cleanup plan. The record of decision is, uh, which is our, we call it the rod through this presentation. Um, it's to remove over 200,000 cubic yards of contaminated waste material from the site and haul it for off-site disposal. Um, so steps will be taken the whole time to prevent releases of this material. And um, one of the most critical components of this remedy is the installation of a best management practice or BMP or that wall around the northern part of the site to prevent releases while we're excavating. So now I'm going to give it to Lauren. She'll introduce herself. Thanks, Ashley. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Polis. I'm the remedial project manager that works on this center. Um, Robert Abhelp has been providing some support as well. I'm excited to finally be here in person to give the community some updates on where we're at with the, the Southern Impoundment Remedial Action. Okay, so just to remind everyone, uh, Ashley went over it briefly, but for this discussion, I'm just focusing on that area in the yellow box. The Southern Impoundment, I just want to remind everyone, is very different, it's a very different portion of the site than what you find in the north. recent work start and on into season one and for the duration of the cleanup. So that was really good uh, kickoff meeting. We also had our most recent um, updated supporting removal. This is the last swath of kind of remedial design um, updates that were provided. Those are still under agency review, but that should be finalized imminently um, very soon. And when they are finalized, they will be posted online. boxes, kind of rectangle areas on the site are soil management areas. This black shaded kind of box here is the, like the office, the admin trailer. This is the road in and out of the site. We've got a decontamination station right here. This is the southern portion of the site for now has uh, four of our water treatment tanks. Those are quite large and diameter.
while the work is being done, so during excavation, we're going to be excavating, managing that water that's produced during the work. Um, solidification, so if the material is coming out, it needs to be solidified before it's disposed of. That will happen in these soil management areas, which I think it's these ones that I pointed out. Um, you know, Last year, personnel arrival, so These are the tank panels stage down here in the corner picture. This is the first shipment of clay that was brought on site for the base layer for the system to be constructed on top. Okay, so moving on into December and January, the types of activities you can expect that are planned right now are additional sampling, our water treatment system startup. So once it's built, we have to run it and calibrate it, make sure it's working correctly before we start excavation. Um, the truck staging and inspection areas will be placed. These. Um, <coughs> So these areas are for when the trucks are coming back.
just kind of going back to the June meeting, probably one of the biggest things I heard from the community was that, um, you know, we needed to meet with the first responders. There was some, some talk that um, even though we had reached out to the LAPC in the area, that the local Channel View Fire Department had been part of that. really is how we try to keep everybody updated in addition to the community awareness committee meetings. All right, Northern Empowerment Remedial Design. So I'm going to skip right down to the end of this to give you updates so since we met last in June. Um, we have received the partial 90% remedial design that came in like right after our last meeting on June 26th. And then we got a 90% remedial design for the northwest corner. It sectioned off that part of the project because it was especially difficult to design. So we just got that November And so these, and I haven't even had that part of the design for even a month, and so that is still under the review. But this is just a review slide. I talked about this in the beginning. So in March, the PRP wrote a letter requesting EPA to alter our response action to the site and ask to delay the sale of the 90% design that we have coming here. And so reason cited in their letter Removing the water through the water or removing the waste through the water column if there is a um, risk of hydraulic heave because um, we, we, we talked about last time we didn't want that happening at the site but something new my mission it again is in August um, EPA wrote a memo to file and that is on the public website where we just memorialized our decision that it was okay to remove the waste through the water column so um, and then So just 
shopping alternative and we have asked all of our stakeholders who are also reviewing the design not to um, review that because it's our remedy called for removal and so that is the part that's the part of the design we're going to review. But I think just the key point of the slide to remember is that we, um, we built this wall around the site so that there's no releases as we're excavating. Most of it's on our website, at least the, the, the major portion of it. And um, But I wanted to just kind of go through and highlight some of the technical challenges and uncertainties that were in the 90% design. Um, so first, excavation. Um, and a lot of these are not new. We've been talking about a lot of these since, well, since the 30% planning on excavating from November to April to avoid hurricane season and then also they're planning to still subdivide into seasonal cells and then you know work in each non-hurricane season and we, we've moved we've seen this wall move a few times over the past year like um, after last summer we also saw the wall if you remember kind of move out more to the northeast to
works right on the south so that's good about that we definitely don't want them discharging anything to the river and then the last thing is just the textile i-10 bridge replacement project so um the 90 percent design claims that there's possibly implementability issues regarding this project such as concern regarding access to the site so imagine if you've, you can think about that access road that goes along i-10 um, truck traffic <laughs> And so some things that they said is um, uh, mainly they just wanted more analysis on the impact to their project. So things like, um, you know, to their bridge, where the bridge is located, where their wall is located, how it affects the protective structures. Um, they just, you know, needed some of that stuff evaluated. And so we actually shared the TxDOT comments early with GHD so that we could go ahead and have a meeting. Since TxDOT is in the middle of their design, if we didn't want to um, slow down looking at all these other issues and not start working on the TxDOT issues. And so we met with them in November, and so we've already started um, coordinating about those comments. And they did um, express also some concerns about the end state of the site, so they didn't want this big hole that's left in the river to destabilize the bridge. And so.
um, you know, we didn't get a formal um, like decision from them. And that's just because as we started looking into it, I kind of mentioned that we found that problem after investigation had already completed. And I think they're, you know, they identified maybe a little more data that we might need um, in order to do that. And so once again, that's why Eve, um, I know that's one of the bigger issues. We've been talking about it since um, I found out about it about a year ago. Um, so that's one of those that we want um, another technical expert to weigh in. Um, if the core is being considered as a technical expert. I mean, they will review it also as part of this 90% design review, but we haven't chosen any technical experts yet. That's what we're like literally in the middle of trying to um, figure out how we're going to get the right people on. But they will also review. Thank you, Ashley. So we're moving on down to my right here. Uh, have questions? Okay. Um, Pam, I hold you to your time. I just want to make, I guess it's more of a comment, I believe, that in the uh, presentation, you stated that people are there at the site, like fishing or whatever, on the weekends. It's every day. People have been fishing out there a significant amount here lately. Right around it, I've seen three and four boats at a time. There's cars parked along Market Street every single afternoon. I've counted as many as 10, as 10 at a time. And most recently, um, last week, I saw people parking across 2100 at the gas station, walking under the north side of the bridge to the south side where it's fenced off. Uh, I saw four people there. So, so this isn't being addressed that there are constantly people fishing all within the area. I don't know that that's the EPA, but who should be addressing that? Because it's getting worse. Now, we talked about the fish advisory some last time and who is it enforceable and who enforces it. I mean, um, that's not all just from the San Jacinto site. You know, it, it's, it's above the San Jacinto site, below the San Jacinto site. It's, it's a large area. Um, and I think we talked about the health department, I think put out all the signage and stuff last time, but it doesn't matter how many signs are up, people still do it. And I don't know that there's really an enforcement mechanism of the fish advisory. I think it's more of an awareness. And um, I know on our site, the signage we're responsible for is that, you know, this is a super fun site, don't come onto our site, you know, and, and we've made sure, um, I mean, we were out there today looking at signage um, that it is very clear not to come onto the site, but the larger fishing advisory area, um, that's just, I know that it's happening. And um, I kind of talked about last time we had looked at, at this boat ramp where people were crowding and stuff, but um, I, it's not EPA that enforces it, um, but the signage is there in a lot of areas, but you know, they'll be fishing right next to the sign. I think it's just a larger problem. Um, well, at pretty much at all super fun sites where you have these advisories, there's always going to be a problem with folks ignoring the signs, taking the signs down, the signs washing away. So that is definitely a challenge. And even sometimes when people know about the decent advisory, they still continue to do so. If there are any comments that, that you can share with us, that we can share with us, that can do some additional efforts, we welcome that. We've talked about it at the CAC meetings, too, um, about... It's not just this part. It's, it's all over. It's all over. Is there any other comments here? Yes, sir. 
Thank you. I'm Roger Bridgewater from Tom Ramsey, Commissioner of Tom Ramsey's office. Uh, when I was looking at your uh, your slides, it talks about the two working seasons. Is that actually talking about two years, 22 and 23? Uh, that's correct. So it would be, well, two working seasons. So if we started this year, we would be anticipating completion of excavation by spring of 24. Okay. Let's move on down. Both sides are just the same. No, 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 that's, that's just the south. Yeah, it's um, two year timeline for that one. Thank you. Second, Commissioner. Uh, let's, anyone else in the back? Nope, let's move on down. Anyone here? Hey, how you doing? Do you want to say anything from the police? Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, now we're going to go back. We still, hey, we're really, really, really making great time here. I mean, they wanted to kick us out at 7.45. Guess what? We're making great time. How about that? Okay, so let's go back over. Any other questions on this end? Any new questions? Yes, ma'am. I have another one from Ashley, uh, for Ashley from Jackie. Um, thank you. Um, under the uncertainties slide, um, you have a quote on there that says that the responsible parties claim that the new wall alignment increases likelihood of hard strikes that could cause BMP failure. Um, she says, first, it's ridiculous that they're designing the wall, then saying that it increases the risk. Um, and then there are best management practices that could be put in place beyond the BMP wall that could slow or prevent a strike to the barrier. To the waste pit, are those types of approaches being looked into? Um, we did not see any structures kind of put out for testing the wall. Um, so, you know, that is a comment and, and something that we've been looking at. Um, they did talk about specifically on the east side of the wall, kind of over here as it starts to get closer to the channel, that putting structures there may impede channel traffic. Um, so I do know that that was one reason why they didn't come over there. Um, but that's, that is, you know, one thing if, if, um, if there's concern that a barge striking the wall, you know, may compromise it. Are there any, is there anything else that you could do to help mitigate that risk? It's going to be built as aggregate. It actually is right now designed to be built where you can drive up onto it and actually put equipment on it around it. Um, and it's like a steel wall with tie rods in between. Um, and then how tall is it? Um, right now it's designed to be nine feet above the regular okay. river level. Deep, I think in some areas it goes up to like 60 feet. Um, so it's supposed to kind of tie into the Beaumont clay that lies underneath the site. Hold on one second, let me come back over here. Do you have any additional questions on this side? Okay, you got them. Oh, hold on one second. And then we'll get you the full back. Ashley, did you say 30 foot wide for the wall? Around that, yes. Looking at this drawing, and that wall is narrower than a lane of traffic on that drawing, which, mm -hmm. is, which is 10 feet. So I don't know if it's perfectly drawn to scale. I figured it was, um, but I do know that it's it's 30, 35 feet wide or so. So we probably need to see a new drawing. So. I know that when they some of these are like a little bit more conceptual. I know when they actually yeah, when they actually um, lay it over. Um, there there are also other drawings that they may be more drawn to scale than other drawings. This one was just kind of like an overview. They have like zoomed in versions that are drawn to scale and stuff in the design. Thank you, Ashley. Did you want to ask another question? Yeah, it was just building off of the the height of the wall. I know that when we were looking through the data, through the data came up, I noticed that the, the you just said the height of the wall was up to that about nine feet above the surface. But do you guys or have y'all or anybody else that's looking at this plan 
consider the max storm surge height because I know that during Harvey and 17 it was around 15, I think is what it says in the data. It was storms have produced flooding that's higher than the nine feet. Yeah, so um, that's a good point. Uh, there is a really good um, analysis in there. It's just kind of in the details of the design about how they came up with that. They did look at river heights that were not in hurricane season, and they're, and that's kind of why they don't want to work in hurricane season, because there's more of a risk that there could be a surge, um, and it could be higher. Um, and so they looked at you know, from what we've been told, all of the data that they could find um, for that area, um, for uh, as far back as they as they could find, and um, and so that if you they have graphs and stuff, and and I remember them presenting it to us that you know this is the height of the wall that would, um, based on historical data, have covered everything outside of hurricane season, um, and so but now that um, it is brought up as maybe an um, inherent risk or implementability issue. That's why it's been added to our list to take a second look at. Because I, I remember when I was going through that portion of the design that it did, like you said, it talked through like how how they did go through it. And I know that we had spoken internally about, you know, putting more emphasis and more weight on the more recent years and the, the heights of the more recent years because the flooding more recently has been increasing and they've been more major than but a little bit more highly on the higher flooding levels than what we But I mean, if we started designing this for Harvey, um, and not like one point, I don't know, if, you know, that would be a whole other review if that's implementable, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's, but that is where our, let's not work here in drinking season, and if we can button everything up, Jackie Young Medcalf of the Texas Health and Environment Alliance, who spent a dozen years spearheading this fight. She says recently completed sampling of the toxic dump revealed dioxin waste buried 30 feet deep, increasing the amount for excavation by 50% to 20,000 truckloads. Enough is enough. EPA, we need you to hold firm. Our communities, the future of Galveston Bay, and the surrounding environment hinges on the cleanup of this site. Dangerously exposed to hurricanes and floods, the Superfund site has already sustained serious damage from a series of storms. Experts fear a direct hit could spread dioxin for miles inland and harshly contaminate large portions of Galveston Bay. Local residents like Bobby Stone with decades of exposure fear for their health. When I was growing up as a kid, we played out there because we didn't know. And there's a lot of people that played out there because they didn't know and they're starting to come back on them now. I know quite a few people that have died down there from cancers. Resident Greg Moss says he can figure only one reason those responsible for the pollution are so reluctant to pay. I think it's just all corporate greed that they're not interested in spending the money to do it right. Greg Moss tells us his dog just died from lung cancer. We checked and that condition is extremely rare among canines. 
Meantime, Waste Management, International Paper, and the EPA have not yet responded to our requests for comment. We will keep you posted. In the newsroom, Greg Grugan, Fox 26 News. Video from the Toxic Big Side is being produced by my son to aid our community side in seeking innovation through our political officials, to obtain a congressional investigation, and to inform various aspects of the community regarding the real toxic waste site problems. Mayor Lowe owned the site a large part of the time, Ralph Lowe from Brentwood. And he had asked me to go on the site. He wanted to show me where some stuff was coming up out of the ground. And EPA was saying it wasn't happening. And so we had the video and we saw the video. And then I happened to be on the phone with EPA discussing this. And we had a conversation that probably lasted half an hour, but there was 13 minutes of it that we took. And it was not, it was not edited or anything. It was just solid for 13 minutes of the conversation straight. And my son happened to put together the 13 minutes of that along with the video from when we'd been on the property. And it's just so contrary. They tell us there's no tars there, no more than you'd find in it. Maria would no more than fill a couple inches in the bottom of a bucket. And at that time you see, and it happened to be Ralph Lowe that owned the place, sticking a stick about that long, that deep into the ground, and there's tars all over it. People are stepping in tars and shaking them off their feet. And remember, the tars were the toxic chemicals. That's the form they were in. And it, it just, if you listen to what was being told us by EPA at that time, and then look at the video, which was back, you just had to realize it was not a good thing. At one point, I'm telling EPA that the kids are getting onto that field because you can see the imprints of their baseball cleats. And in one case, we found a baseball there. The kids are getting onto the site. And the man from EPA tells me, he says, Marie, that site's not only fenced, it's posted. And in that part of the video, you see my feet are spreading apart a sign that's old and dirty, and you can tell it's been laying on the ground for quite a while. Well, it was the sign that was supposed to be posting the site. But my comment to him, because I didn't know what was going with the video, my comment to him was, and but some, some of those children too are too to little to read. And his words, pretty close, were, Marie. We can't function as guardians of the neighborhood children. And that, frankly, blew my mind, because I thought the Environmental Protection Agency, to me, that was the governmental agency that was there to protect not just me, but the kids, all the neighbors. They were there to watch out for us and take care of us. And here was the spokesman for EPA telling me that they couldn't take care of the neighborhood kids. Well, if they're not going to take care of the neighborhood kids, then your mama's going to die for And that one video at that baseball meeting got 100% vote to shut down the ballpark. Because the people at that meeting also did. We are the Skaggs family, uh, Matthew and Cosette, and we are owners of Jellyfish Island. We've lived in this house seven, eight years, and I had not put up Christmas lights yet. I've already done a half job by putting up the green. Of not getting up on a ladder and putting my own lights up every year. I mean, other companies uh, will pay them to, to put lights up for a couple months and take them down and store them. This is awesome just to have lights all year round, not only for the holidays, but for the security and the accident. We got jellyfish lighting for all the things for holidays, for birthdays, spooky Halloween lights are super fun. If the kids want Rainbow Sparkle or Elsa Castle. And of course, Christmas, you still have Christmas. For everything. For everything. From the ease of, of getting the bid to the installers to the communication, it was, it was awesome. The ease of using the app, they now have a cloud app, which is awesome to use to adjust anything you might need. So over the past year or so, I've studied and pondered history more than any other time in my life. And one thing I've found is... It's the people that are willing to get things done by any means necessary that do the greatest harm to society. And, and the rest of the population is there to deal with the aftermath. Welcome to Harris County, Texas. 
home of the largest number of EPA Superfund sites in the state. EPA has what they call a National Priorities List and Superfund Alternative Approach Sites. Texas has a total of 70 of these that are either current, proposed, or now deleted. And Harris County alone has 16 of the 70. By comparison, Dallas and Bear Counties each only have four. My first stop today is at the Sykes Disposal Pits. This was designated as a Superfund site around the year 1979. It operated as an illegal open dump from 1961 to 1967. Hundreds of drums of chemicals and many more bulk loads were disposed containing benzene, phenols, and other contaminants, likely from nearby petrochemical companies. This site is regularly flooded by the San Jacinto River. From 1983 to 1995, large quantities of chemicals and contaminated soil were removed. According to the website, cumulus.epa.gov, since completion of the remedy, vegetation has become reestablished and the majority of the site is now vacant, except for the Love Marina at the western side of the site and an off-roading park called Down South Off-Road Park is located within the site on the north end. This ain't the Garden of Eden, but that old serpent just might be around here somewhere. Next door to Sykes Disposal Pits is French Limited. This was designated as an EPA Superfund site around the same time. It was used for sand mining operations from 1950 to 1965, then used for petrochemical waste disposal from 1966 to 1972. From 1989 to 94, excavation and treatment of contaminated soil took place. Right next door to a retirement community is the Crystal Chemical Company Superfund site. They produced toxic herbicides here from 1968 to 1981. The soil and groundwater became polluted with arsenic. Site cleanup began in the 1990s. Last but not least is the U.S. Oil Recovery Superfund site here in the town of Pasadena, which consists of two properties an inactive used oil processor and a wastewater treatment facility. The former wastewater treatment plant was owned by the city of Pasadena. The EPA has removed large quantities of benzene, contaminated sludge, and contaminated stormwater, and also removed waste from many tanks and containers on the site. And I have to tell you, the smell is strong here. I don't want to stay here very long. What do you get when you mix a toxic waste dump with a flood prone area where hurricanes are common? A recipe for disaster. So over the past year or so, I've studied and pondered history more than any other time in my life. And one thing I found is, it's the people that are willing to get things done by any means necessary that do the greatest harm to society. And, and the, the rest, rest of the population, population is there to deal with the aftermath. Welcome to Harris County, Texas, home of the largest number of EPA Superfund sites in the state. EPA has what they call a National Priorities List and Superfund Alternative Approach Sites. Texas has a total of 70 of these that are either current, proposed, or now deleted. And Harris County alone has 16 of the 70. By comparison, Dallas and Bear Counties each only have four. My first stop today is at the Sykes Disposal Pits. This was designated as a Superfund site around the year 1979. It operated as an illegal open dump from 1961 to 1967. 
hundreds of drums of chemicals and many more bulk loads were disposed containing benzene, phenols, and other contaminants, likely from nearby petrochemical companies. This site is regularly flooded by the San Jacinto River. From 1983 to 1995, large quantities of chemicals and contaminated soil were removed. According to the website cumulus.epa.gov, since completion of the remedy, vegetation has become reestablished and the majority of the site is now vacant, except for the Love Marina at the western side of the site and an off-roading park called Down South Off-Road Park is located within the site on the north end. This ain't the Garden of Eden, but that old serpent just might be around here somewhere. Next door to Sykes Disposal Pits is French Limited. This was designated as an EPA Superfund site around the same time. It was used for sand mining operations from 1950 to 1965, then used for petrochemical waste disposal from 1966 to 1972. From 1989 to 94, excavation and treatment of contaminated soil took place. Walking through Brownwood today, it's easy to forget that it even used to be a neighborhood. The last house here was torn down over 30 years ago, and the streets that once carried traffic slowly submit to the encroaching wild. It may be hard to imagine now, but this was once one of the most desirable neighborhoods in the city. When Brownwood was developed, starting in the 1930s, the land here was dry and rose high above the surrounding water. The lush, expansive lots were marketed to executives at Baytown's large refinery and its waterfront location made it an attractive place for families to buy. By the end of the 1950s, there were more than 400 homes here. Unlike most of Baytown, Brownwood lead an upper middle class. It was, by accounts of the residents, an idyllic place to grow up. Kids spent their summers exploring the banks of the bay and bicycling down the meandering streets of the Southern Division. It would ironically be the refineries that would eventually lead Brownwood to its demise. Through much of the 20th century, a climate of loose regulation and environmental ignorance led the industries and municipalities in Southeast Texas to pump groundwater without restraint. Much of the Gulf Coast, not just Brownwood, sank in some places by as much as 15 feet. The peninsula that had once separated Brownwood from the channel became an island, perhaps the first sign of the way things were headed. After Hurricane Carla in 1961, it became clear that something was wrong. New construction was halted as doubts about the subdivision arose. The area had grown increasingly flood prone over the previous few decades. Residents who were used to staying through hurricanes found themselves trapped in their homes. Over time, docks and bulkheads had to be raised as they sank slowly into the water. Even trees began to die as the brackish water of the bay poisoned their root systems. Determined, the residents of Brownwood brought in fill and even constructed pumps and levees in an effort to protect their once dry neighborhood. The neighborhood's grandeur was in peril, but many residents stayed. As time went on, however, the land would continue to subside. It no longer took a tropical storm to flood the subdivision. Now, even in clear weather tides, water could inundate the low-lying homes, and the future of Brownwood was in serious question. Hurricane Alicia in 1983 was Brownwood's death knell. Groundwater pumping had been stopped by this point, but for Brownwood, it was too late. After evacuating for the storm, Many of the residents weren't allowed to occupy their homes, and in the years after, Brownwood became a haven of looting and dumping. Only a handful of people remained in the subdivision to keep an eye on the abandoned homes and streets. Expansive custom homes sat empty and left to rot. Baytown's most desirable subdivision had become a wasteland. Faced with a public nuisance and safety risk, the city began buying out the landowners. What remained of the homes were torn down, and even the most stubborn owners who had stayed through all the storms were eventually forced to sell. Ten years later, 
the city opened a nature center here that remains to this day. Not much is left of old Brownwood. Many of the streets have completely overgrown or sank below the water. Even the docks and bulkheads that once lined the shore are barely visible today. Occasionally, you find a solid reminder of the neighborhood's old life. There are still manhole covers, the sewers below long filled. The ditches that once drained water to the bay now lie perpetually full of brackish water. A few slabs remain. You can see where walls once stood, and even tile from a shower, whose vibrant color long outlasted the home that once contained it. You can imagine the light that once occupied the knolls and shores of Brownwood, but today, it lies as a reminder of just how wrong a place can go. Walking through Brownwood today, it's easy to forget that it even used to be a neighborhood. The last house here was torn down over 30 years ago, and the streets that once carried traffic slowly submit to the encroaching wild. It may be hard to imagine now, but this was once one of the most desirable neighborhoods in the city. When Brownwood was developed, starting in the 1930s, the land here was dry and rose high above the surrounding water. The lush, expansive lots were marketed to executives of Baytown's large refinery and its waterfront location made it an attractive place for families to buy. By the end of the 1950s, there were more than 400 homes here. Unlike most of Baytown, Brownwood lead an upper middle class. It was, by accounts of the residents, an idyllic place to grow up. Kids spent their summers exploring the banks of the bay and bicycling down the meandering streets of the Southern Division. area actually used to be a subdivision. In this recreated wetland, you'll find the typical water and waterfowl, but you'll also find artifacts that serve as a reminder of what once was. Manholes, a telephone pole, a house foundation, tile, bricks. But just how did human activity sink this place and turn it from neighborhood to nature center? The Brownwood neighborhood was founded by executives of Uncle Oil, which would later merge with Exxon. At its peak, around 1,500 residents lived in Brownwood. The peninsula Brownwood sat on was surrounded by the Burnett, Scott, and Crystal Bays. Residents loved the view that came with the waterfront property, but they soon began to notice that those very bays were creeping into their backyards. Between 1906 and 1983, this area sank 10 feet. The subsidence, or sinking of the land, was mostly due to excessive groundwater extraction. Land in the southeastern United States is made up of sand, gravel, and clay. Too much groundwater removal compacts these sediments in an irreversible way. As a result, these layers are able to store less water and the land elevation decreases. Subsidence is a natural process, but it's normally on a small scale and takes a long time. It's human activity that speeds up and exacerbates the sinking of the land. The oil industry was, and still remains vital to Baytown's development. The city's growth was spurred by the discovery of oil and establishment of a refinery. The growth of Humble Oil in the Baytown area led to an increasing demand for groundwater. Brownwood being on a peninsula in close proximity to the refinery and Baytown caused it to sink at a rapid rate. With the decreasing elevation, Brownwood became more prone to flooding. Storms and high tides hit the area harder, making it more difficult to live there. Hurricane Alicia hit the neighborhood hard in 1983. Rebuilding was possible, but with conditions only getting worse and the cost of damages racking up, the city declared Brownwood a hazard to live in. Residents were forced to leave their homes, and the properties were bought out by FEMA. After some development, the area became the Baytown Nature Center. The water is now welcome and home to marsh and wetlands wildlife. I am delighted that they have done this to this area. It's kind of a bittersweet thing to come down here and see it, but it's okay. It's okay from what has been made out of this area down here. And it's a, I'm hoping that the district will still bring the children down here because it's a very important part of it. Brownwood was just one extreme case of subsidence. It was beginning to be understood how widespread the issue really was. An article titled Disaster Part 2 Houston, published in 1974, reported on not just Brownwood, but how the whole Houston area was sinking due to the petrochemical industry using 190 billion gallons of water per year. Worry grew over the region's increasing vulnerability to hurricanes. The harris galveston Subsidence District was created in 1975 to reduce groundwater usage and slow subsidence. This graph shows how land compaction after 1975 greatly slowed from its previously sharp increase. Oil production, though a major user, of course isn't the only reason water is pumped from aquifers. 
Subsidence districts work to conserve water usage across the board and encourage using a mix of groundwater and surface water. Once the sediments have compacted, it can't be undone. And even after taking steps to reduce groundwater usage, the land will continue to sink before it adjusts. Residents of Brownwood experience firsthand the impact human action can have on the landscape and those that live on it. Awareness of our consumption of resources is vital to ensure the future of not just humans, but all life on Earth. KTRQ-TV Houston. We care about Texas. Live with the entire Eyewitness News team. This is Channel 13 Eyewitness News. It was once paradise to Brownwood residents. That was back before hurricanes Carla and Alicia. And today that Baytown Peninsula is paradise to migrating birds who are heading to South America from Canada. Elma Barrera standing by live right now at what is now the Baytown Nature Center with more. Elma? Exactly. Remember the Brownwood subdivision? Well, this is it. I'm standing right on it. This area used to be covered with homes. Just to give you an idea of where we are, there's Baytown in the background with the smokestacks. And to the west of us, the San Jacinto Monument. So this is now a nature center, a wetlands area that helps birds with their migrations. Remember Brownwood in 1983 after Hurricane Alicia? Houses destroyed, rising water and subsidence. After a long and bitter battle, the city of Baytown bought them out and residents moved on. The land sat, and from that emerged a life-saving master plan. Mother Nature has been very quick to reclaim this land, and I think that's probably what has inspired a lot of us uh, to work towards it becoming a nature center. From there, the dream took flight. In the last 10 years, Baytown has developed the wetlands to continue what Mother Nature started. But people don't realize, I don't think, how just, just how many species of birds we, we can see here and, and have here and that need our habitats in order to survive because they have to come after those long flights. They lose a lot of, a lot of energy, a lot of fat stores, and then they, they feed in these areas. After resting, the birds gather enough strength to fly across the Gulf of Mexico to Central and South America to the rainforests. It is also a dream come true for bird watchers. We can see more species of birds here in a, in a year than any place else in North America. That's the upper coast, six counties included. Here in the Nature Center, six different kinds of birds on the endangered species list have been spotted. And this is only the beginning. This is brand new. This is just a, a nursery grasslands right there. And like I said, in just, just a matter of a few years, it'll, it'll be a, a full marsh. And the Nature Center is also used for breeding crabs, shrimp, and the like. And like you can see, it's also used for fishing by the public. Reporting live, I'm Elma Marrera, 13 Eyewitness News. From KHOU-TV Houston in the spirit of Texas, this is 11 News at 5. As folks in North Carolina begin the cleanup from Hurricane Bonnie, people here are still remembering Hurricane Alicia 15 years ago. Charles Hadlock tells us about a Baytown neighborhood that disappeared after Alicia, but is now taking on a new and very different life. The Brownwood subdivision was swamped by a 10-foot storm surge from Hurricane Alicia. 300 homes were destroyed on this low-lying peninsula. Residents had been flooded out so many times before that after Alicia, Brownwood was ordered abandoned. And now, 15 years later, some of the houses are still standing, just barely. And the Brownwood subdivision is home to a new breed of residents. They need a place, and this is a place for them. Baytown decided to turn the old neighborhood into a wildlife sanctuary. Bayshore and Ridgeway and MacArthur Streets, prominent in the old neighborhood, belong to the herons and the egrets now. This is probably going to turn out to be the most unique resource of this type that Baytown has ever had and probably will ever have. 400 acres in the shadow of the San Jacinto Monument have been transformed into the Baytown Nature Center. Mm -hmm. And nature has taken over. A few of the wrecked houses will be left standing, a reminder of how powerful nature can be. You have a healthy respect for the storm surges and all that that comes through with the, the hurricane. The hurricane wiped Brownwood off the map. The people have moved on, and the birds and wildlife are now at home. Charles Hadlock, 11 News, Baytown. And in fact, Baytown is considering several grants to make the Nature Center a place where people and nature can come together in an otherwise urban environment.